All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. You've reached the internet's home for all things masonry. Join On The Level Podcast as we plumb the depths of our ancient craft and try to unlock the mysteries, dispel the fallacies, and utilize the teachings of Freemasonry to unlock the greatness within each of us. I have you now. Welcome back to another episode of On The Level Podcast. We have a great episode today. We have a very special guest, a good friend of mine, uh, brother Kevin Oatman of uh, Manatee Lodge, number 31 in, in Bradenton, Florida. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, brother. It's an honor. So, uh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> They're cheering okay, you on. I've been looking forward to this, so I'm glad we're able to find the time to be able to get together and talk. You're a busy guy. you got a lot going on. I do. Yes, yeah. I, mean, I do. I want to talk about that. So oh, okay. I'll tell people probably don't know your name listening all over the world in Freemasonry, but they will. Uh, Brother Oatman joined, I want to say like two years ago. Does that sound right? Um, it was 2021 early yeah 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 so uh, yeah i years. became interested in 2020 but i actually got in about i think 21 yes sir right after COVID. i think i had the i think i had the honor of doing at least one if not two of your lectures for your you did. degree you have that and that's yeah. what you know yeah again that's where i was introduced to you and yeah of course from that point on i've been inspired for what you've been doing and what you do and how you well, hold yourself up. So that's very, you've been, very uh, early. Yes. Thank I you. Of you. Yes, sir. You've been um, a good friend and a lot of help to me as I was finishing up in my lodge. So yeah, greatly appreciate it. It's just odd to be at the beginning of somebody's journey and mine is kind of like waxed and waned. And now I get to sit back and watch guys like you really start to blossom in the lodge and become leaders. Uh, but, it's really something to watch. Uh, it really uh, is. You guys uh, learn, uh, you in particular, you because you're a very uh, intense person, I guess is the best way to say it. I feel like you really, when you latch on to something, you go for it all the way. Is that yes, fair to say? It is. Um, yeah. I'm one of those go-getters. Um, I grew up um, with a military background. My family was military. So with that and part of you know, most of that regulations and stuff that I'm just, if you do something, you don't have to do it. You do it a hundred percent. You do it yeah. right. And then, you know, my mindset is too, is go 110, 120%. So uh, it doesn't matter what I do. And you're aware of all the things that I'm, more, you know, involved with. And you I, can, I you think can, I only know it. some of the things you're involved <laughs> with, and it's already pretty impressive what I know. Well, thanks. I, I mean, I'd like to cover some of that, actually, because people should know your background. Um, yeah. we It's a small town in Sarasota where we um, both lived uh, and you still live in that area. Um, yes. Because I was in the automotive industry and had a friend that I met at a convention who said I should come and try this uh, F3 Nation well, yeah. um, thing one day. Yes. And, uh, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, yep. He works for Gettle Automotive yes. Group. I won't yes. say his name and embarrass him here. <laughs> uh, but he's a very good man. And he talked to me for a while and he convinced me to do it. And I went at five in the morning. And there's this group of guys just killing themselves, jogging, burpees, running up and down hills. I mean, we were doing sit-ups and push-ups. It was like yep. intense. I was yes. like a pile of like dog food at the end of that thing and i was just sweating and then they throw you in the middle and they start asking you all these questions and they give you your cool name yeah. so um i went through the whole thing <laughs> then i came to find out you were part of that after i met you um and now i see all the time online and then i'm looking behind you and i can see you're obviously a very fit person into personal like uh fitness uh so how like 
Maybe you could just explain a little bit. What is F3 Nation? Let's start okay. there. So uh, first and I want to ask you, what was your name? What was your F3 name then? So I'm Comic-Con. Okay, that's it. Okay, that's right. So yeah. F3 Nation is a men's workout group. Um, at first, it started out as nationwide. It started in North Carolina, but it has grown so much in the last 10, 11 years that is now international. Um, so basically, it's a workout group for men. Um, it's free, and it's held outside all the time. And we've got five core principles. But one reason why we require it to be outside is because we want it to be accessible to any man, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're minority or anything. Being outside allows that person to have that access. Should we be inside, then you may have to get a membership or you have to be mm. in a community or something. But by doing it outside, rain or shine, that gives access to any other men. So the, we call it F3 because of the three Fs, which is fitness, fellowship, and faith. And pretty much the faith part of it is pretty much like masonry. We have to have, in a way, you know, some form of belief of, you know, some spiritual belief. Um, but I, I assume where we are in Florida, it's like masonry. It's mostly Christian, probably. It is mostly. But, yeah. you know, around the world, um, you know, around the country and stuff, we've got a lot of other um, sectors of religion involved. And, and again, it's not a pivotal or a focus point that we have when we do. Um, right. We have our fitness. You know, it's just, you know, we just have a faith and a lot of us, you know, close it with the prayer. But we do have <laughs> brothers and packs who close it with just a spiritual saying or something like that. It's not an obligation. But, you know, those three Fs tie it in. So it connects us and to us, it improves us and makes us better as men, pretty much similar to what the Masons do. Yeah. Um, the purpose of it is to improve ourselves and who we are as men. We It makes us better. It makes people better husbands. It makes us better spouses, you know, better leaders, you know. Yeah, your wife is going to, your your. Your significant other is going to like you a lot more if you're svelte and lean, yeah. and, you know, you guys are definitely, I mean, I saw the one time I went, I might've gone twice. I think Bing's father was there. So there's like, we're talking about people in their seventies working out with guys in their twenties. Correct. Yeah. So you could go out there like the other day, other morning when I was out there, we had a young guy who's 18 years old, but he was doing, you know, the same thing as everybody else as well as we also had someone who was 74 years old. So, of course, you know, living here in Sarasota, the demographics is just, you know, how do I say, with respect, a little bit of older, yeah. you know, age yeah. demographic. But um, well, we'll call it what it is. Florida is the place that uh, old people go to die. That's what it is. Well, it, that's what we've got the reputation for. But I was just at um, one of my runs this morning and the group that I'm involved with my running, I've got 70 and 60 year old people out there running with me. So when I have some of my other older friends say, no, I can't do that. That's not possible. I wish. I don't see that because right. I'm around people who are 60s, 70s, and even yeah. 80s who are out there. No, yeah. they're not running 15, 20, 30 miles like some of the younger you know, runners and some of the athletes are. However, at least they're out there and yeah. they're doing something and they're active. Yeah. So, you know, you can't let age dictate what you can and can't do. And it's just like with masonry. You can't let age or anything stop you from where you want to go. Um, through my travels, you know, while I've pretty much considered to a lot younger, a younger Mason, within my last three, three and a half, four years in my travels, I've seen leaders <laughs> coming out of Masonry as young as 20, 25 yeah. years old, all the way up to 80 and something. So yeah. you can't let age define who you are and what you're capable of. Absolutely. So, as long yes, as you're alive. Yep, and then then the fight continues. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm very aware of your background. And I'll, all I see are medals. And I know that I know that you run marathons. Are these all from different marathons that you've run? They are. 
Now, um, you can't see them. They're all the way around the room. One good credit about it is I've been running since high school. So it's not a new thing. So these have accumulated over the years, you know, over the last 30, 40 years. What? How old are you now? So, Do you mind me asking? So in July, I will hit the double nickels. I'll be 55. 55. So, yes. Okay. Uh-huh. How, but, you've been running since for over 30 years now. So. I've been running since high school. Yes. Yeah, so I started running um, cross country. Um, as you, most people know, I'm a small guy. So, of course, I was too small to go. I went out for freshman football and the coach said, nope, you're too small. And you think I'm small now. I was really small when I was in high school. So the only thing that really that involved athleticism or activities that I could really be good at was running. So I jumped in there and started my cross country career with high school and kept going since then. It still seems like it'd be harder for a shorter person than for a taller person. Like, you know, a tall guy, you'd think you'd have a bigger stride, make it easier for him. It's funny because the other day at work, you know, someone says, Kevin, you walk so fast. It's like, it's because I have (laughs) to, you know, all my life, I've had to keep up with tall people like you. Um, Yes, my stride's a little bit faster, but I'm, yeah, it is. But I think it's more of the effort. And, and you know, in the long run, it benefited me because putting more effort into those strides, whether it's walking or running, it just build up that endurance. And, you know, that's what, you know, I'm pride myself with my run is the endurance part. Yes. You're so well-rounded. It's fascinating because uh, this is something that our fraternity is lacking, I think. Yes. We are very, very good on focusing on the internal of a man, but not so much the external. Yep. And mm-hmm. um, I've been, I've traveled a lot in my short time in the fraternity and I see, we don't like to eat healthy. We don't like to do healthy things. We don't like to exercise generally as Masons. And so um, I think it's a really good message for Masons that you just said, it doesn't matter how old you are, right. you can do something to yes. try to fight it and go to keep going. Yep. To keep going. Yeah. And and it's and it's weird, even, you know, and as you get to know me and I'll explain later, you know, I contribute a lot of different facets of my life and putting it all together, whether it's getting up at four or three in the morning to go running, going to the workout, or, you know, being involved with my church to seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. Those that those different strengths and experiences make me a better person so being able to be not necessarily i don't run to stay fit it helps but mentally it keeps me fit and by being fit mentally it helps me when i'm at the lodge and doing anything i want with the masonry so i think the impacts of those different spectrums of my life come together and helps me become a better person it makes me a better person oh, whether for it's sure. inside the lodge or whether it's outside yes now, that's you, how actually, I look at it. you actually served in the military no i did okay. not so i'll give you a little bit of history of my background so i was born in vietnam back in the 60s you're vietnamese i am i am okay. vietnamese well let me say i was born in the vietnam however i'm more filipino than filipino vietnamese. Right. So as history knows throughout the history of Vietnam, as well as the Philippines, the Philippines have always wanted to, you know, leave their country because of the government, stuff like that. So the majority of the Filipinos headed east, which is over to China or to Vietnam. So a great deal of the population of Vietnam is Filipino. It's got a lot of the Filipino DNA in there. So, um, out on the streets and stuff, most of the Filipinos recognize me more of them as being part more Filipino than I am Vietnamese. So I was born during the midst of the Vietnam War. What? Um, you know, yes, I was. Wow. Um, and when I was about a year and a half, a military family adopted me and they brought me to the States. And so I've lived pretty much with the exception of being stationed, um, you know, throughout the country throughout the United States, I pretty much grew up here in Florida. So I've lived or been familiar, lived in Florida for over 52 years now. Wow. Yeah. So So, you think we would talk about this stuff, but we don't. We're really just 
we're winging it when we record these podcasts. So if I'm getting too personal, please tell me to go pound sand. But what <laughs> what happened to your parents? So we don't really have an official, um, I'm assuming you're meaning my biological parents. Your biological parents, yes. So I was um, pretty much abandoned and I was found by a Vietnamese orphanage. So their story that they related to my, um, you know, American parents or adopted parents was that they were killed. So, but there's no proof of that as well as, um, it's funny. I don't even know what my real birthday or real age is because at the time, you know, back in the sixties, there were no documentations associated to who I was or what I was. So at the time when the babies were being adopted out and get out of the country, they had to have a birth certificate. So they took a lot of the birth certificates of those babies who have already deceased and put those with those who did not have them. Oh my so goodness. I was given somebody else's Whoa. birth certificate and that's how I was able to come over to the United States. So wow. really, I don't know if I'm 55 or 54 years old or 55 and I don't know my real birthday. Um, that is insane, brother. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. I, mean, it's I didn't unique. know that. Yeah. So a great deal, you know. And you've researched, right? I'm sure at the, by this point in your life. Yeah, because um, the Western world was not able to have access or go visit Vietnam until the late 1990s. But once um, it opened up, I had the advantage to be able to travel over there. Um, I went there two, three times, but on the last two trips, I was able to look at my adoption papers and do some research. Because even back in the nine, nine, late 1990s or even early 2000s, research of that time on the web is not as detailed yeah. and informative as what it has been in the last five, 10 years. So since then, I've been able to research things and gone back. And the last time I went, I actually hired a tour guide to take me out into the Mekong Delta to the area where I was from. And I was able to go back and actually see where um, the orphanage I was at and talk to them. Mind blowing. Um, man. Yeah. And then on that trip, what I did, because I know it's a third world country in that area, it's very, you know, um, they don't, they didn't even have, barely have electricity. I was able to, I took like four or five suitcases with me of school supplies, you know, clothes and stuff. And I took it to the orphanage and they were so did. happy. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. such a good person. <laughs> but I would, I would have never thought about that, but that makes perfect sense that you would do that. Yeah. Mm, so, I'm sure they was, really appreciated that too. They did, but it was an interesting country because a trip, not only because I was able to go back and see where, you know, my home country and what it was like, but um, I also was told too by my mom that if you can travel abroad when you're young, don't wait until you are retired. And so between my 20s and 30s and 40s, I visited almost, I've traveled to almost all the Asian countries as well as Central America and South America. And by being able to, especially with uh, Asian countries, you just learn so much and you have so much more of appreciation of the world and yeah. the people, but you get so much appreciation of what I was able to benefit by being an American here in the United States. Yeah. So I see things so much different in ways that most Americans don't even realize what they have and don't have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've talked many times about how I feel like I won the lottery when right. I was born, you know, I'm tall. I got blue eyes. I have my teeth. I have most of my hair. <laughs> like I get, I live in the United States right. as, as a man. Like yep. mm -hmm. I, I, I got all the boxes ticked off. So like yep. if I don't succeed, what kind of a loser am I that I had all these benefits and can't succeed. But right. um, for you, I'm sure it feels the same a little bit. Like you feel like you hit the jackpot. Being raised oh, I, in the United States versus over yes. there, like that's a right. massive advantage for you. I have, and, and, and I don't take for granted of what I have. I knew it was a blessing and a gift for being able to come over here because I have access to free education. I had access to, you know, get secondary education. 
with my um, college degrees and stuff, as well as being able to become a brother for the, you know, as a Mason. Um, yeah. A lot of countries aren't able to do that. Yeah. But um, so, yes, I've always appreciated and thankful for what I was giving and the advantages. So, like, when I hear people today complain because they can't do this or go somewhere, I just shake my head. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me yes, but it's like a double-edged sword because, I'm, I mean, we are very lucky in this country. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> we have. We are. You yes. know, air conditioning, Absolutely. electricity, internet, we can, right. you know, we're only limited by our own desires and drive, really. I mean, we even are. your circumstances can be overcome if you're persistent enough. Right. I mean, um, your economic circumstances that you're born into. There right. are now, this is what I want to uh, is look at the other side of the coin, because I, I try to put myself in somebody's shoes whenever I'm interviewing them, thinking about what their life must be like. And I can see the one side, how you feel so lucky um, and you appreciate probably more than the average American things that everyday things that are happening to you. But then at the same time, you said you lived your whole life in Florida and you're Filipino slash Vietnamese. Now, there isn't a huge Filipino slash Vietnamese yeah. community in Florida. No. So you have to stick out like a sore thumb wherever you are, right? Like in school. Great yes. school. I mean, and, and it's it's funny. People ask me, you know, do I know much about my culture or history? And until I got out of college, no, I didn't. Because if you're a Filipino living in Gainesville, Florida, back in the 70s, <laughs> you're not going to find any Asian or Filipino culture in Gainesville, Florida. Right. <laughs> So, so you're, you're trying yeah. your hardest to assimilate, right? And just be like everybody else. You're not trying exactly. to be different. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, yes, you're right. I did stand out, um, you know, um, so. How hard able... was that for you growing up? I mean, kids can be, I mean, if even if you have nothing to pick on, they'll find something to pick. Oh, on. it was. Yeah, I was an instant target, you yeah. know, um, and fortunately, my parents were able to, you know, help me understand at an early age that I'm going to be different. But I wasn't different. I was unique. Nice. And I think that's what helped because, yeah, kids could be mean. Oh, merciless. And, and kids are horrible. Merciless. But, you know, I think that's what helped me become as strong as I am now is yeah. because I have to admit, yes, I was bullied. I was tortured. I was harassed when I was a kid. I mean, even up to, I hate to say, even to now, you know, I'm used to that. I get that all the time. But you Still, know, as a because, grown man, it, yes, you get bullied? Yes, Mm -hmm. Yes, that's something. Yeah, it, it happens to this day and age. I mean, I guess even you're like an easy target for a bully because bullies tend to go for people they feel confident they can harass, beat up, do whatever yeah. they want, and they're, they're yeah. never going to fight back. And it doesn't help that I'm only five foot one. That's you what know? I'm saying. Your height must make a bully feel like, a oh, this is the guy I'm going to get. Yeah. So, and it's funny, and I think this might lead up to something that you and I were discussing a couple of days ago. You know, we can, today's society is pride on, you know, proud to say that, hey, we accept everybody. We're, you know, we, we're equal. We do this. But to this day and age, there is so much um, stereotyping and there's so much bullying and harassment. And, and, and that is with, I've gotten more harassed and discriminated as an adult than I did as a kid. Really? Yes. Wow. And see, um, this just, this goes to show you both sides of the argument can be right because people, you said it in the beginning, like you get upset when you hear people talk about like, Oh, I can't believe I, I can't do something, but you're like, bro, go over there. You can't even vote in my country. Like, you know, you have, exactly. but at the right. same time, we have a long way to go still. We do. We shouldn't we feel do. like we've achieved the pinnacle of cultural excellence. We have, we have definitely improved ourselves since the fifties and sixties for sure, without a doubt, we have. but we have a long way to go before we're where we should be. I think we do. And, and what a lot of people don't realize is, you know, they're guilty of it themselves, yeah. but they don't realize it. Yeah. Because I hear yeah. things at work all the time, things that are said. 
Um, yeah, and and it's you know it's well, it's, you traveled well, a lot extensively. You said and right. I didn't travel until I was an adult. I grew up in upstate New York, and the only okay. people I knew were other people on my block. Basically, yes. I mm -hmm. had a pretty small life, and um, you know my own parents were quite racist in hindsight. Like mm -hmm. we would be driving and I remember if we saw a black person on the side of the road, my mom would be like, roll up your windows. Don't look out the windows, kids. Right. And uh, I would be mm -hmm. so scared. I'm like, oh God, like they're going to get me. And, right. uh, you know, then when we moved out of state and I was like thrown into like a whole different world, I was subjected to so many different people and cultures and right you know i worked at disney that was my first real job and talk about uh, diversity <laughs> disney is like an explosion of diversity all over me right and, uh, you know i just i just love it i just love it there's no amount of diversity that's enough for me now and right. i don't know what changed in me because i started out a very american closed-minded mm -hmm. the way i was raised and i as an adult i think it, i attribute it to star trek um, okay. Start yes. growing up. I watched. I didn't have a father or male, you know, so I I learned most of my moral system from that show. Right. And they harped on diversity being a strength. I did, mm -hmm. and I think that's what got into my core as a child and as an adult. Um, I feel like I'm always fighting because there's always a fight when it comes to that stuff in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I can be very annoying to people because I'm always trying to squash it and I'm trying to bring light to it. And, uh, people, yeah. you know, they just want you to just be quiet, man. Just, just let it go. It's in the past. Leave it alone. It's like, it is for you. It is. Yeah, for you. And, and that, that is too. And then when I, um, bring up the issues, I bring up things that are sad, mostly, yeah, especially with my coworkers or, or even people in F3 and so forth. And even with my Knights of Columbus, you know, when I bring it up, it's not like that I'm sitting there condone, you know, condoning it or, you know, getting on to them. It's just I'm trying to educate them because yeah. you know, some of the things that are said, you know, there are certain sectors or certain classes. If you were bluntly stereotyping or saying something offensive, you know, we're very cautious about what we say about those different classes. Because so much but, light has been shined on them for so them, long right. that but people because, focus on that. <laughs> Correct. But other things that people have said, you know, um, with this, again, the demographics here in Sarasota, they tend to be the older um, and their mindset. Yeah. Well, not to say that's a, not to say it's an excuse or that it's allowable or, con, you know, condoning, yeah. but their mindset with the way we're brought up was yeah. different. Yes. So um, with me being from Vietnam and then growing up around these Vietnam veterans, I've gotten so much harassment and mistreatment. So I'm well, yeah, your your people were the enemy when they were in the military. Right. right. I remember when I had a discussion um, with my mom and my sister. Um, they were American, and my sister was Vietnam Vietnamese as well. And she said, and I was telling her, explaining to them, you know, how much discrimination and bullying and everything was harassed. And I said, well, that's weird. But my sister said, I never had that. You know, no one ever did that to me. And my mom would said, I never saw that. And I was like, because growing up, most people, if they um, associate an Asian lady or female, they associate to geisha girls, yeah. quiet, petite. But when, especially the generation, your know, greatest generation and so forth, and the boomers, when you think of an Asian male, you automatically think of the Korean War, the Japanese yeah. War, the Vietnamese War. So those were their enemies. So yeah. unfortunately, I was the, you know, impact or the effective that yeah. came out of those three wars. So that's what made the difference. And yeah, but you can't change the past. You learn. And I think because of all that, it's made me a stronger person. Well, My skin is very tough. I think there are two kinds of people in this world. There are victims and there are people that overcome. And uh, mm -hmm. my, I have family that had the exact same upbringing I had. And um, you can see the victim and what that life looks like as an adult. Yep. Everything, mm -hmm. everything is someone else's fault. Everything. Right. My mother's mm -hmm. fault, somebody else's fault. And then there's the other type of person who 
apparently is you who is like, what else? What else you got? Give it to me. Like I'm, I'm going to fight. I'm going to succeed. I'm going to overcome. What, yep. what do you got? Like, tell me I'm too short. Okay. I'm going to outrun you. Tell me exactly. I'm not smart enough. I'm going to beat mm -hmm. you at that game too. Like, I feel like you are the type of person who might have gone through life facing every challenge as exactly that, like something to overcome and prove yourself. Exactly. And, you know, and, and swear, it's not that I'm out to prove myself to anyone, but when you oh, tell yourself. me or in a way say that I'm not capable of doing something, it doesn't matter if you're 10 foot tall or my size, I'm going to do my best to prove them wrong. And, <laughs> and that kind of helps me to where I'm at, you know, you know, with them in masonry, as well as the other things I do. This you is know? why you're such a huge asset to the fraternity, because you have such a well-rounded life. Um, you have the leadership skills from your job, uh, mm -hmm. your career, I should say. Um, and also just your upbringing and who you are as a person with the military parents and uh, you know, yep. having been bullied, let's say, and having to overcome that kind of stuff teaches you a certain patience with people, it does, I guess yes. you could say. Mm -hmm. You right. have to tolerate, tolerate. Yeah, that's a better word. You have to tolerate more than right. the average person. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. so when they talk about subduing your passions, you're like, yeah, you know, I got that. No problem. But everybody else is like, that's their biggest challenge is trying to subdue their passions. So you're Correct. ahead of the game in many ways when you come to the fraternity. Well, thank you. I, I mean, in many ways, because kind of words. Yep. Mm -hmm. You talk about your um, Knights of Columbus. You mentioned that. I would love to talk about that. So not yes. only were you a military uh, brat, uh, you were physically active your whole life and still are to this day. Uh, you have a government job. You you have a very respectable career. Don't um, tell too many people that I have a government job. I, <laughs> I'm not going to say where. You, that's for I, you. I get harassed about that as well. Really? <laughs> but yeah, because when you tell them that you're with the government or something, they think that I'm aligned with those who are in mm. power, that mm. I sit there and agree with whatever they do. And you know what? I work for the municipality. I don't necessarily agree with everything that's going on or yeah. what they support. So that's it's funny because of all things that I gotta hide in my life or should be keep, I do not tell people what I do out there unless they really? ask. Yes. Oh well, I think it, it, uh, people, you know, for some reason, when you work for the government, you get a certain level of credibility. Uh, that that's better than even a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, well, employee. yes and no. It's got that, you know, how to say, two-sided thing. Same thing with attorneys. So if you say you're a lawyer, some people are going like, oh, they gosh. They hate you and respect you. They <laughs> hate you. And it's the same thing with the government. They either hate you or you know what I do. And I'll tell everybody what I do. I'm actually a um, comprehensive planner, urban planner for the municipality here in Manny County. So therefore, with all the growth, the development, I'm heavily involved with that. That's what I do. But, you know, when someone finds out that I work for the county as a planner, then all of a sudden I'm the target or the blame. Mm. So how I tell, how I explain it to people is, you know, in those old movies when the townspeople have the pitchforks <laughs> and fires going after the city or the mayor, that's basically what they're doing. But um, as well as if you tell them that I, when I tell them I work for the county, they're like, they think I know everything from right. what time their garbage gets picked up or why right. the traffic light on Manatee Avenue <laughs> is out to, you know, so that's why I'm cautious about what I, you know, what I tell people what I do. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I totally yeah. get that. Um, I'm proud, to, but I'm proud to work for them. Yeah, I'm, I'm that's proud a great. To, you know, I, mean, I love doing it, but yes. I hope the benefits are good. <laughs> they are. <laughs> One big reason why I'm there. Yes, and the, the retirement's great too. So we we've got all of these things in your life that are leading you to be a leader, and now we come to like your faith, and this is something that you've also been like everything in your life apparently like all in. Uh, you've been involved in the Catholic Church. You didn't play around with a non-denominational church or a, a Baptist or Presbyterian. No, Catholic. You've been Catholic, Catholic your whole life. Practicing yes. Catholic. Correct. I don't mean that you go to church on holidays 
you're practicing. Could you talk yes. a little bit about like how involved you've been in the church and so and, as you and said, how that leads into the night to Columbus? Because that's something <laughs> I want to talk about. So it's funny. I'm not what we call them trifectas. And we call some Catholics trifectas because they only come out on Ash Wednesday, right. Easter, Christmas. Yep. No, I go to mass, you know, all the time. I'm at my church four and five times a week. So, um, and, I, and I was, it's a funny again, and why I have so much faith is growing up, my family didn't go to church. Mm. But for some reason, something told me as a six-year-old, I need to go to church. So by the time when I was six years old, I found my way to church, whether it was a teacher to come by to get me or somebody else, a parent coming by to take me to church or if I walked. I went to church every week since I was six years old. And again, my family didn't go to church. So that was all on me. That's so almost 50 I, years. Correct. So even at that young age, when my mom, you know, made me realize how appreciative life was because I'm here in the United States, I just felt like there's that God put me in the right place at the right time. And my contribution or for me to help pay back is being faithful, you know, have a strong faith. And that's what I continue to do. And, you know, as I grew up, that faith becomes stronger. Mm. And to this day, you know, one of the things that people have said to me is, Kevin, we know your faith is so powerful and what you do. We have no doubt of what you're capable of doing. So I chose, or I, you know, to be Catholic because it went along the guidelines, you know, the lines of what they believed and what they stood in, but because they are regiment, you know, just like the military, you know, you go do this, you do this. Mm. Today, we're going to do this. And what helped is in my travels, no matter where I was in the world, I'm going to get the same message. Mm. And that's what I believe. And I did. And, and that was such a great advantage, a bit of it too, is when I traveled, whether it was in the Central America, South America, or Asia, when I went to Mass, it was the same thing. So, um, Yes, I, you know, I have the Catholicism plays a big role in my faith. They made an impact on me um, to the point, as you're saying, of the Knights of Columbus. I am so dying to hear about the Knights of Columbus. I, I only know about them. Um, my wife's father was in the Knights of Columbus, but he's definitely yep. not. A, and I no. couldn't talk to him. And uh, one time I was at lunch and these guys, I thought were my wife thought they were Masons having lunch behind us because they had what the right. same exact kind of badges we have on. Uh -huh. um, but when I asked them, they were, they, they kind of held up their nose. Like what? No, like right. we're not Masons. Uh, we're Knights of Columbus. And I said, Oh, okay. And I shut up because I've heard through the Masons that the Knights of Columbus don't like us. Um, I see nothing in Masonry against the Knights of Columbus. So what is that about? Well, what are the Knights of Columbus about? And where does this like, they don't like us thing come from? So Knights of Columbus is a Catholic organization for men. Okay, that's dedicated to, of course, community service and serving God. So it was originally formed back in 1833 by one of the priests who happened to be up in New York. Okay, and what he realized is back at that time, a lot of the workers, you know, the steel workers, things like that, mm -hmm. um, or different um you know, trade works. Yeah. When the husbands, of course, at that time, the man was the only breadwinner. But if something happened or they were, you know, had deceased, the family was left without a head of a household or working, you know, someone to take care of. So the Knights of Columbus were formed to um, support the widows and their families and providing for them should one of you their know, husbands or their fathers passed away. And so that's how the Knights of Columbus came into play. Um, you know, and again, if I'm moving forward, I have so much respect for who they are and what they are and what they do. Well, you're but one of them. I am. Yeah. So, but at, at the same time, they emulate 
what the Masons do. Really? Um, it's no secret now. It used to be secret. We couldn't tell people what we did or how we did things. But from my perspective, all the quote unquote ritual and, uh, you know, esoteric and stuff was so, is almost like mere image of what Masons do. You were in the Knights of Columbus before you were a Mason. I was. So I've been a Mason for um, probably 15 years now. Knights of Columbus and, for 15 years. Uh, excuse me, I'm saying, yes, yeah. yes, my apology. Yes, That's the Knights it. of Columbus. So I started out um, and I eventually became the Grand Knight as of, um, yeah, about three years ago, I became the Grand Knight for my council. So I just recently- Is that um, like equivalent to the master? Or... Correct, it is. Yes. Okay. So um, it's equivalent to the master. And a lot of times I got to be careful because we address our Grand Knight as uh, worthy, whereas uh. we address our master as worshipful. So I had to be cautious. Um, one reason the Knights do not like the Masons or against them, and, do, and according to some, uh, most, and even the Pope has, you know, uh, you supported this is they don't you cannot be a mason if you cannot be a knight of columbus if you if you're a mason and the reason why is because with masons we don't actually use the word god we use address as the great architect we do and pray to god all the time um, we do but we don't say it we say god our, we don't say jesus though correct i think that's so, probably but, the one that is the but, itchy but part of it too, but in their eyes, if we're not allowed to say Jesus or God wherever we want mm -hmm. and we're restricted, that goes against one of our beliefs and what we stand for. So therefore, that's why. Um, that's basically why. So well, that's um, too bad. You would you would hope they could have a little bit of tolerance, you know. Um, you think they would, but um, but. If you being go a to Christian other, organization, I have a little If you power. go to other parts of the country, the Knights of Columbus work together with the Masons. They understand how they work together and that they're not contradicting each other or who they are and what they believe in. You know, when I became a Mason, I'm not surrendering or I'm not losing any of my faith or giving up anything that I have with my Catholicism. And what I've told many is my masonry empowers my faith right. more than anything. Right. You know, the Knights have to admit over the years, they become less restrictive, less, um, you, know, um, you know, how do I say, demanding. Mm. So we could sit there and tell you everything that goes on. They're free about that. You know, we could do whatever we want, whereas the Masons... You know, we're a little bit um, regiment, regimental, yeah. more protective of who we are and what we do. Yeah. So I think that's the big difference. Um, and I, I'm proud, you know, I have nothing to be ashamed about. I'm proud of it, of being the night of where I am. Um, I think also, it's good for people to hear that from your lips because um, I have family and friends and their biggest thing about what they don't like about Freemasonry is they just don't believe me that they think it's its own religion, that it's its own faith, that they're going to subvert what you believe and make you believe in something that Masons believe. But horse shit, it's not true. Um, it's not. I can't no. tell them that, but you, no. people hear you. You're, you've are you been active in, in Catholicism for 50 some years almost. Well, you said <laughs> uh, thir at least uh, 40, 40, okay, for right. a long time. Uh, yes. and, and you've been active and you've yeah. participated and you've given and uh, you, you get it, you know it, and you join the fraternity. I'm sure you had some hesitations at some point. Everyone does because you just don't know for sure until you join, you know. Uh, right. But now you're here and not only again are you here, you're active in it. You're an officer in a lodge. You're going to be the master of the lodge. Um, and God knows where you're going to go from there, hopefully. Uh, I'll I'll live to see you become uh, the Grandmaster one day. That would be an honor for me to see that. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, actually, and I have no doubt you'll get there because uh, you're so stubborn uh, And once you get into something, which is mm -hmm. the trait I admire. 
But, you know, I, it's something people need to hear because you just said it. It didn't detract from your faith in Catholicism. It enhanced it. It did. Yes. So, and you know, it sounds cliche, but everything I've learned from my nights and my experience with them have helped me become a leader and understanding more of what you are. And going back to the idea that I keep saying it's almost mirror image to what masonry does, it kind of helped me understand where we're going, where I'm going and what I need to do. Mm. And so by being the grand or excuse the grand knight, I understand the importance of what needs to be put in place. For leadership. As, I, as I'm hopefully bound for the East. Yeah. That's going to help me. Um, so, you know, the masonry's masonry helps me become a better person, not only with my faith, with my Catholicism, as well as the night, but at the same time, everything I've got out of Catholicism, especially the nights have helped me to where I am today. And, and, you know, I'm going to keep that faith and that's where it's going to go. Um, who knows if it gets out and they may they say, may I not like you, not like me anymore. Yeah. I just look at it as, you know, what God has a plan. Yeah. He's going to put me in a place. And, and it's funny because when I first got into masonry in my mind, I'm sitting like, there's going to be a point where I'm going to have to decide which one or way the I'm other. Go. And it wasn't long after I joined masonry that I knew at some point it's like, okay, I know which way I'm going to go if really? I have to decide. And here I am still. And so far, you know, things have been, you know, well for me at this point. But well, yeah. I think it's mm -hmm. important to note there's nothing in Catholicism that says you can't be a Mason. Um, no, these are was... these are individuals choices. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it very much is a regional thing, too. It's like, where do you live and and who's in charge as exactly. to if you're going to be accepted or not? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we, it is. we talked a little bit about this before we started recording. Um, I'm not a Catholic. I was raised Presbyterian. Um, and I don't even know what the difference is, honestly, because uh, right. I've never been to a Catholic church. But, um, you know, the the tenets and the belief system is very different from the practice. And exactly. I've, right. I've I've been told recently that I'm no good for masonry, that people say that I'm divisive and tearing things apart. Um, and I think that's because I'm not afraid to talk about things that should right. be talked mm -hmm. about. And people Correct. maybe don't like that. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in Freemasonry, it's the same. Like the system is beautiful. It's almost perfect. Um, and it, it works every time if you if you follow the system. Uh, but the people can screw up a wet dream. I mean, people are just people. Um, and so, right. you know, if people's only experience with masonry is through someone that maybe isn't a great mason, you can see how they that that person and the everyone they touch is, yeah, it creates right. like a deadly spiral of negativity. Correct. So, you know, the only answer to that for us and for Catholics is to be a good representative of the system, not like the people around you necessarily. Be more faithful to the system than you are the people yes. and you'll be okay. And you'll be a good representative of whatever system you believe in. It is. And, and, and that's the thing too, is even with the Knights, but especially in my, you know, home life, traveling is the key word. Okay. Yes. I'm proud to say I'm a traveler man because that has <laughs> so much you know, yeah. symbolistic to me, because if you travel, if you go from, we'll say council to council, church to church, or even in the lodge, you're going to get so many different perspectives. Oh God, and yeah. so, so many people that you can't sit there and force yourself to go one way because you're going to see so many ways of doing things, whether, you know, if you're in Thailand and you're traveling on the left side, you know, reading signs that are totally oblivious. The people are the same. The process is the same. Mm -hmm. Whether you're at the Knights of Columbus and you're up in Tennessee, your faith is going to be the same. 
The yeah. people may be different, but your faith is going to be the same. So yeah. same thing with masonry. You know, I understand and I know, you know, a great deal of how my brother is in the lodge works. But when I've traveled, you know, throughout the district, you get different perceptions and you see me different people. So you cannot be tuned to just one idea, one yeah. format. You see so many different ways of doing things and perspectives. And I think that, you know, embraces that strength of who we are as a brother. That's one great thing about this fraternity is that it encourages travel because yes. the I always heard from a young age that the cure for ignorance is travel. Mm -hmm. If you stay in one place and only know the same people your whole life, you're ignorant of so many things in this world. Right. Um, and you really do need to get out and live a little bit and see a, a little bit more of the world to understand the bigger picture. Yep. And, it, and, it, that, and, and, and again, you know, going back, I, yes, I'm kept from Gainesville and there are people, my school classmates and friends that I know who are still living in Gainesville and have not yeah. traveled outside of <laughs> Tallahassee. That doesn't take away from who they are and what they are doing. Right. It just gives the rest of us an advantage and the benefits of being able to see uh, the yeah. other rest of the world. And you can be friends with those people, but I, I, I would venture that they sometimes say things you think are outright dumb or ignorant, and you just have to kind of, you know, keep to yourself and be like, well, they don't know any better. And and, but that's what the make that's what the world you know makes the world go round our yeah. differences. But what makes us better as brothers in masonry is we can accept those differences. Yes, we can accept other ideas. Yes, we don't have to support them. We right. don't have to agree with them. Right, but we can accept them. Yeah. and that's what makes us brothers and true brothers. Yeah. and you know again with the knights, the great men. Some of my brother, greatest friends and greatest brothers are great, but there's most of them are so selective and they don't even want to open their minds that there's other organizations or other things that can help, yeah. you know, with their faith and society. They're just so not willing to open their minds to that. So. That's too bad. That's unfortunate. When you get in yep. that, um, that place, you're basically mm -hmm. dead already. I mean. There's no, yeah. there's no growth. There's no opportunity for improvement. You're just, you're going to decay and die when you get to that so, place. Yeah. So I have to admit, um, just last week I was nominated to be the district grand knight. Congratulations. So that's However, I turned it down. What? Because, well, it's an honor, but at the same time, I want to focus my attention to my journey and this is more important and at the same time too i would feel like if i'm standing up there amongst the district leading these guys which i know most of them which way they're thinking or what yeah. they want to proceed with i don't necessarily agree and again i could accept it but i don't feel like it's my place to be their leader and not really support everything that they're wanting to do. Well, that's okay. So, Just give it a few more years. We'll make you a district deputy in the yeah, 23rd Masonic yeah, District. So I'd rather focus my journey <laughs> right now as hopefully I'm bound for the East. I want to focus my attention to that. I oh, think you're the junior warden of your lodge. You're, you're, you're on an unstoppable journey to the East now. There's no getting out of it. You're in for the long haul now. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm already, you know, preparing myself. I'm looking forward to it. I'm sure you it. are. I, hopefully, you know, eventually I'll get there, but I'm looking forward to it, you know. You know, um, uh, I'll bring it back to the beginning. We talked about, I was there for your, I was definitely there the day you were raised a Master Mason. Yes, you um, were. Mm -hmm. it was, there were several brothers that day, as there usually are when you do a Master Mason degree. I didn't know you at the time other than I had done another degree. So I kind of saw you and maybe we shook hands and said hello. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was in the mood the day you became a master Mason. Like I was, uh, it might've been the first time I was allowed to play the third base in the master yes. Mason degree, we'll say. Right. And um, it's a big role. So I, I take it seriously. And uh, I was good friends with the master, Anthony, uh, tomorrow. 
Omar, yes. And sir. he was he happened to be Solomon. So well, he and I were standing there, and I'll tell the story. I hope it's not embarrassing to you. No, 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 at all, because it's memorable. Because story. you know what? Correct, right? If it's a memorable thing that oh. helps teaches others, that's great. Well, Go. you had you had a, a diverse group that went through with you. There was like an older gentleman and a younger gentleman, and you were kind of in the middle. And uh, I got, I was like, hey, you know what? I went to Anthony and I said, you know, I think I could like really rough, not rough this guy up, but I think I could do something different. And he said, go for it. And I was like, are you sure? Because I don't know um, if he's going to be okay with it. And he said, trust me, he's going to be okay. Not only is he going to be okay with it, he's going to love it. I said, okay, all right. So you came around and uh, I struggled a little, but I did get you up over my head. I grabbed you and picked you up over my head and I'm, I'm saying what I got to say and doing what I got to do. Um, I realized once I had you up there, I had no plan for what to do once you were up there. So mm -hmm. I just kind of put you down and we finished the whole degree. But honestly, my, I couldn't stop thinking about, I hope I didn't offend this man. I hope he's okay with this. Uh, and you got up at the end and said some pretty heartfelt words that day. Um, and you looked right at me and said, thank you. I appreciate everything you did today. And I thought, okay, he's okay. <laughs> uh, but yes. There was like an hour where I was just beating myself up. Like I went too far. I, I, you did it. You did it now, Chris. You went too far. Uh, no, unfortunately, you know, brother Anthony, he knew who I was and what type of person I was. So he knew how he knew athletic you were and that you, and it, and, it, and it was a great opportunity and not only for you, but it was a great experience for me because I'll never forget it. And I'm sure <laughs> you'll never forget it. I won't. So again, it was the right time at the right place because yeah. how many other opportunities are you going to be able to do that? Or anybody never, be able to do never. That? You're not. I'm like so, six foot three. Your house, how, <laughs> how tall did you say? Five foot one. Five foot one. I was like, this yeah. just seems like it's supposed to happen right now. So yes, and it, and it did. And you know, it's been. And not only did that make that stronger bond with you, but it made that experience and memorable. So, yeah, I'm sure it was memorable yep. for everybody in the room that day. <laughs> but now when I go and see it happening to others, I'm like, that's boring. It. <laughs> <laughs> that's it we had a special day yeah. yeah i don't think that's ever been done and i doubt it will ever be done again hey and you I know what know. and if if the experience you know resonates through others and helps them you know experience get more out of the experience then that's the best thing that can happen you know I, well really so. honestly ever since then you've been a big supporter you you always came to my lodge you always helped when you were we asked you to help you're wearing the t-shirt that you purchased. You didn't yeah. accept a free t-shirt. You had to pay yeah. for it because that's the kind of person you are. Um, and you've been a supporter. And uh, I really appreciate that. And I feel like now I can maybe return the favor. Maybe I can start to support you a little bit now. Uh, You've always supported me. I mean, you know, more ways than one, you know, and it's like anything else. It's the little impacts, or let me rephrase that, the big impacts that you make on someone behind the scenes yeah. that's the importance right well that's where the yep. important stuff really happens you know yes it does those meetings so are... me, yeah you're gonna help me out eventually in the <laughs> next couple of years so i i i am very much looking forward to your journey and um, seeing it you've been you know you came to my lodge and you did an awesome education which we were going to talk about today we'll we'll talk about it another time um, yes. And you're continuing to do uh, new educations for your lodge. I, I saw you in my lodge do the, the playing cards presentation. Yes, uh, sir. Mm -hmm. I saw the presentation. You let me look at it, the Jack the Ripper presentation, which yes. I'm sure went well. And you told me you're doing another one tomorrow in lodge. That yeah. sounds really mm -hmm. interesting, um, actually, about the Booze Club and the and the Knights of Columbus and all these other groups. Yeah, because a lot of times, and I'm sure I'm not, I'm not the only one, when we do tell our friends and coworkers and peers that we're involved with the Masons, they're like, well, what is that? Is that like the moose? Is that like the yeah. eagles? Is that like such and such? So basically, the um, presentation I'll be presenting soon is the differences between those organizations and, you know, what they do for the community and how, you know, 
what we do versus what they do. That way, we get a better understanding of who we are, but that way we know what to say to separate us or distinguishes us from those organizations. Um, I wish now, I could see it in person. Uh, I'll see it. You'll do it again. Well, I'm hoping most of your guys will be there because some of your guys, because we've got the traveling. They're planning to come get it. And they're planning to come get it. We don't have much luck with that, though. Wherever we go, somebody else always comes and they always outnumber us. So, yeah. So, the last three times we've gone to places and we've been outnumbered and didn't come home with a traveling gavel. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing some of you all there tomorrow night um, at our meeting. But, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be asked to do the Masonic education for Manny 31, um, but I take a different approach. And I know once in a while I'll throw in, you know, what masonry does or basic things, you know, what we can do on the education. But I truly believe that when I come up with some of these unique presentations that I've come up in the last year or so, it draws a different interest for the brothers. Yeah. You know, sometimes when we say, okay, we got Masada's education, they're going to like, okay, what are we going to do? Somebody's going to print out something out. And and yeah, exactly. And so I just feel that if I add a different uniqueness or an interesting element to something, you know, somebody could say, well, Jack the Ripper, that's not, you know, you're just a presentation. But if you really read into the presentation I made, it makes you think of, who we are as Masons, yeah. what we do and how it contributes. So it's not the presentation itself that I'm doing to educate. It's the thoughts or the mindset or how you're thinking about this presentation. Yeah. That to me is stronger to build that connection for what Mason Masonry is. Yeah, it forces them to look at something they know, they think they know, in a different right. light. And like, Correct. and that kind of drives people's, uh, and this is the point of Freemasonry. We are supposed to come together with our different backgrounds and different religions together mm-hmm. and yes. ask the big questions. And it we're is. all supposed to give our perspectives and we're supposed to try to read into what the stuff means. And we're right. supposed to try to find a personal answer for ourselves. And right. so those educations are really triggering one of the main things that's required to be a good Mason, which is critical thinking and yes. trying to look at something even mundane in a different way, a little more right. critically. Yes. So as you can see, you know, from what I've told you about my history, that's basically the, you know, my whole life. I'm not typical. I'm different. I'm unique. So whatever I've had to do or whatever have been brought to me, I've had to step out of the box and think, how am I going to be able to accomplish what everybody has been able to do, but in a different way that would help me adapt to what's going on and succeed? And whether it's by faith, whether it's by education, fitness, or masonry, you got to step out of the box every once in a while and look at it from a different perspective. So- And that's how I see it. You know, many could say that, well, Kevin, we didn't do it this way, or we've never done it this way. Tradition calls this. I understand tradition. I represent, you know, I respect that. But at the same time, you got to make it interesting so it doesn't become the norm. Does that make sense? I think so. And that's how I approach things. Mm -hmm. That's so needed in in our fraternity because we have been around a long time. We have. And, mm-hmm. and the reason, as you said earlier in the podcast, you said um, we maybe have held closer to some of our tenets than others have. Like, um, you know, and, and that's something that everyone loves about the fraternity. But at the same time, you don't have to hold everything that closely. Like you can innovate. You not not with ritual work, not with like changing words. But like, even in the way that you talk about something can be innovative or the visual aspects that you bring to your PowerPoints can be creative and things that people, the playing card thing, when you're relating, like everybody's played cards their whole life, but 
when you start to look at each individual card as you do and you break it out and kind of tie it into different Masonic things, it starts yep. to make you, we're supposed to look at the whole world around us in this way with wonder and right. critical eye and like try right. to find meaning in everything. And so I think this is really a highly overlooked part of the fraternity is mm -hmm. people that bring their personal experiences to the mundane and and present something to me this is what masonic education should be presenting something to masons in a way that makes them think about masonry but also makes right. them think about themselves in a way yeah. that, yep. is, i don't know if you're yep. doing that on purpose but that's what i see in the presentations uh, I, I do shared with me. i mean just you know without going in full detail with the the cards yes you take a normal deck of cards everybody knows it but when you look at each of those things that you just said, but then with those cards, you're never sure of what you're dealt with, just like life. You're never sure what you're going to be dealt with in hand. But looking at those different symbols and see how they play out, it makes you think, how am I going to strategically play the right cards in order to succeed? So that is the whole backbone of that presentation, not that the king represents this and this. It's putting all that together with your experience in masonry and how you're going to put those things, those facets together in life. So hopefully your journey will become successful. I and... love it. That's such a good tie into <laughs> everything we've been talking about today. A deck of uh -huh. year. When you play cards, people say that it's a game of luck. People that know cards know that it's not a game of luck. It's a game no. of skill. Right. Um, and it's how you react to the cards you were dealt, what you show to people, what you yep. think in your head, yep. how you, the decisions you make, there's a lot of skill in cards. The losers are the ones saying, ah, oh, you got lucky. You get all the lucky cards. Like, Correct. Mm, right. I don't know. Strategic. And it's just like with masonry. Yes. It's strategic. It's a matter of how you play your cards. If you plan ahead or whatever you're dealt with as you go through it, Hopefully, in the end, you'll have the right cards to have a successful journey. If you yes, play sir. your hand right. If yes, you play sir. Your hand right. Yes. And uh, I think that's something that I caught, like, I, I don't know. As I get older, I think the veil lifts from of the mundane kind of goes away a little bit as you get older. And mm -hmm. um, I don't have time for the bullshit anymore. So I, I surround, and if you've listened to the podcast, you know, um, I do. I'm mm -hmm. a big yes. For me, it's like I'm I'm drawn to people that were broken and yeah. uh, overcome because there's just they're living life, right. um, and you can see somebody that's unplugged from the matrix pretty quickly and recognize, and then um, it's a special person that uses whatever they've overcome for positive and for to help other people and to show, even though you're getting so much negativity all the time, you're trying to use it in a positive way, the way you do you deal with it. And right. I for sure saw that in you when you were raised uh, that day as a master mason. Um, you exuded that in the the things that you said. Uh, everyone gives a speech. Mostly everybody likes to stand up and give a speech when they become a master mason. And some I've, I've heard many, many, many guys say the same thing. You know, it's the standard stuff. Thank you. This, this, this. Right. Uh, Cliche. You can tell when somebody's speaking from the heart. And it's an authentic thing. And you were. So I was kind of drawn to you from that moment because I saw, okay, this is somebody who must have been through a lot. And they're like, but you were very positive and thankful and grateful. Uh, yes. And you have, um, you have your shit together despite everything. You think so? I okay. do. Uh, and that's one thing I need to. <laughs> it's hard, Dave. You're, you're yeah. showing that you have your shit together, even though maybe on the inside you don't. It does. And, and you know, go um just stay on what you just said too, what many people don't realize. And, you know, of course my lodge does, but I'll tell everybody else out there. And one thing that helped me get over, you know, fight my battles is because of the effects of war or you know, being over there, I am blind in my left eye and I'm deaf in my left ear. So growing up. I don't think a lot of people they, know that about you. No, oh, and I don't really put it out as much, but we had one of our great brothers, you know, to me as a legend, um, brother, right, worshipful Robert Leonard. 
he recognized that when I was going through catechism. Mm -hmm. And because of that strength of that brotherhood, he was able to help me overcome those challenges with my hearing and my sight to get me to where I am. So yes, I've, I've been through a lot of challenges. Things have been thrown at me to think that I'm not going to be able to do what everybody else is, but here I am. And that's, what's given me the strength. And, you know, masonry is the same thing. It's a challenge. I have to admit it's not easy. <laughs> and I tell people, you know, when I tell people, people need like, to know that, you know, you think, people, you think it's easy. You're just going to get in the line and cruise control right, right to the east. And, and 147 recently got a new EA, which is a good friend of mine. Um, and I told him when he reached out and inquired about it, I said, I think you'd be great at it. You're a good fit. But let me tell you this. <laughs> it's work. It's not something yeah. that you can sit around and just. I said, that's a lot of work. Yeah. If you're willing to work, you'll get so much out of it. And I'm looking forward to his journey as well. But yes, it's been a challenge. But, and of course, when I was going to the South, people said, Kevin, there's a lot of work that's going to occur <laughs> for you for the next three or four years. And I'm like, okay, bring it. I'm not afraid of work. <laughs> bring it on. And believe me, they bring on, they've given me a great deal. But you know what? I'm ready for it. Uh, I, it. There's no challenge that I can't overcome. And this is no different than anything that I've had in my life. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it too. Um, your lodge, Manatee Lodge number uh, 31, 31. Yes. is the oldest lodge in our district, District 23. Um, I'm sure they talk about it all the time. Uh, whenever I talk about Manatee, I always do. Um, the mm -hmm. fact that you, you were a moonlight lodge, people would only meet on a full moon because there was, that was the only time they could see to get there and home. Um, that's yes. all. And you go look at the past master's wall and you see the history. Um, my lodge, Sarasota lodge has history too, but not, not like yours. Um, and I felt the weight of that more when I became master, honestly, um, I saw it and I appreciated it, but when you're the master and you realize that your name is now added to the collection of men in the unbroken chain that goes mm -hmm. back to those days, the weight of it. Sure. If you're a good master, you'll feel that weight um, a lot. And I sure did. And I know you will too. And I just want to say like that lodge has some, it's, all lodges have their interesting situations. All of them do. And Manatee is no different. Like you um, really, you talk about this history and the majesty of the lodge because it should be. Um, but, you know, you have ups and downs. You have peaks and valleys. Your lodge um, as, it wasn't all, long as ago. All other lodges do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Your master was removed by the grandmaster. Yep. Like, Correct. And everyone was shocked. And you have a past district deputy that came to the Master Mason Association and didn't shy away, didn't try to cover it up, stood up like a man, like a mason, and explained the situation and said, please work with us. Please be patient with us. Um, yep. And the district, really, and you all have, we rallied because you did. we you all have our have. issues. We, we can understand, you know? And, right. uh, and so you, you coming from such a historic lodge, people might think you, you're on easy street, but you know, you're kind of on yeah. a rebuilding phase in that lodge now, where you've got Correct. to rebuild things, which means a lot of work. Um, yeah. So when I first went in there and saw that wall with all those past masters and the history, and I'm like, wow, just can you imagine? And I have so much respect for every one of them. And as I've got as through the you know, through the years, I've gotten to, you know, know some of the most recent past masters. And of course, much respect. But I've learned how, you know, their tenure and their year was and how they, you know, who they are and how they possess I, I get much respect, but to me, it's not intimidating because I hopefully could have my picture up there, but I'm sure that each one of them up there has its unique personality. Yeah. They were unique in their own ways. Yeah. And I've never, you know, thought of myself as being the norm, like everybody else. I'm unique. So I'm hopefully going to be able to go in there and do what we, those past masters have done 
and successfully run that lodge, but at the same time, put my uniqueness in there yeah. and become a legacy to, yeah. you know, when they say past master or worshipful Kevin, they know that there is a difference between my year and what those past masters have done. Yeah. Um, you know, again, it's much respect um, and I will hopefully not disappoint them if I should ever get in the East, but at the same time, I want to, you know, do something respectful, but I want to set my own uniqueness and my own year of tenure. I and that's what I can't to do. wait to see it. I know that is going to happen. And that's why you're going to be a great master because you're going to bring all of this history you have with you to that position. Um, you're doing it now. I mean, we always talk about being the master, but that's, that's like just another chair. Like, you know, it is. you're, yes. you're doing it now. I mean, you're already bringing yeah. it to your, you're handling the trestle board for your lodge. You know, you're trying to do a lot of uh, things that they haven't done for some time. And these are all good for the lodge. And it's good for you to have a, the ability to do this for them because this is how we show our love. We, mm -hmm. we work. That's, yep. that's big in masonry. We do the work. And when you do, do the work, it's meant to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> but you appreciate what is being done yes. and you appreciate and respect the work that past masters and everybody else before you came. Yeah. And of course, you know, it's not intimidating, but at the same time, I don't want to disappoint right. everybody who came before me and I'm going to do my best to, you know, keep vanity and keep its history. And that's the big thing. As you mentioned, the challenge that we had, you know, Yes, it was a challenge. And a lot of times I felt the impact of, you know, what had occurred last year, you know, on the backside. Yeah. But, you know, the whole time it's like, you know what, this is just a one time thing. Things are going to move forward. And you know what, we've got to adapt. We got to move on and don't let it get to us and just move forward. Yeah. And that's what we're going to do. I mean, the biggest thing I think uh, Manny 31 is set out to do right now is to ensure that we keep that legacy going. We keep that history going and, you know, we're going to hit some mountains and sure. valleys as all other lodges have. Yep. And you know what? We're no different than any other lodge. We're going to peak and we're going to go down, but we're going to keep going. We're not going to stop and cease to who we are. We're going to keep going. And a hundred years from now, when you've got all those past masters and hopefully myself, as well as the current master, when those brothers a hundred years from now, look back, they're going to sit there and say, they kept it going. Yeah. So yeah, well, it, it, it is. And, and, and as I drive into the lodge, we have a, I think it's a graveyard or cemetery. I'm trying to think. There's a difference between a graveyard and cemetery. You know the difference, correct? No, I don't know the difference. So a cemetery, well, a graveyard is right next to a church. A cemetery doesn't have a church. Oh. So I'm trying to remember. I think we have a cemetery across the street. So every time I drive by it. Really? I And yes, and we have past masters and Masonics, uh, Mace brothers in that. Hmm. So every time I drive by there, I'm thinking, I can't let them disappoint it. They're watching me from across the street. They're watching us. Yeah. And they're making sure, and I'm making sure they can still see us across the street. That's something important that I think more Masons should have on their mind as they're in the line is that yep. don't, don't disappoint the work that everyone before you brought. Don't exactly. disappoint. Don't disappoint. Don't do things for you. Do it for them. Do it for the people Correct. behind yes. you. It's not about right. you. You're just a link in right. the chain. And that's what I've always said. It's not the title that I have. You come up to me and call me Kevin. You could call me brother. But it's not the title. It's the work and the effort and the initiative and the love that and the passion that you have that makes the difference. So if I get into the East, I think that's great. But yes, it's a chair. I'm just there to make sure that we keep going and that legacy continues. And that's what we need to all focus on. I need you to stop you. saying hopefully. And I think <laughs> you got to remove that stuff from your vocabulary. It's going that's to happen. It, so. It's going but to happen. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah. 
So yeah, I do. But yes, I am very positive about my journey and I can't wait to see where it goes. You're doing even great past. things for Manatee Lodge and also for our district because you are a traveling man. You do visit other lodges. You're active in the Master Mason Association now. Um, if you listen to the podcast, uh, one of the things I like to do and now that it's just me and I'm interviewing a lot of people is uh, give them an opportunity to have the last word on the way out. Um, I've taken up an hour and 20 minutes of your time. Uh, we didn't get to the playing card uh, presentation. So I propose you come back and we do talk in more detail about that. Now that people know who you are, yes. uh, we can talk about some of your education next time. But um, I, I want you to know from me um, and Sarasota Lodge, you're appreciated. Uh, you helped us a lot and you're continuing to help us. The guys really do appreciate everything that you do. Uh, Zach called me that you were there and he said, you're always such an awesome person. You're always willing to help. And uh, that's Thanks. just uh, being a good you. brother. You're a good brother. Uh, it is. Mm -hmm. And so we're thankful. You know that I'm grateful. I'm hopeful. Um, I know you won't disappoint. I have no fear that you're going to disappoint. Sure. Listen, you're human. Like I'm human. We will make mistakes. We will have a bad day. But at the end of the day, I think you're going to look back and be really proud of the things that you've done and, and the people that you've impacted uh, as you are currently impacting people's lives already. Uh, so, yes, I wanted to give you the last word on the way out. We, we have listeners all over the world that are Masons uh, far outside of Florida. So um, what would you like to say to those brothers well, first, Chris, thank you for having me on here. It's been an honor. I've listened to your podcast for, you know, for a while and seeing who you've had on here, it's, they've inspired me, they've impacted me. And I, I just feel honored that I can be one of your guests. So hopefully I'll be doing the same for others out there. Um, my word of advice, it's just like when I have people coming up and asking me for the advice about my running. You know, over the years, I've experienced a great deal of things. And I'm going to tell you the same thing to those brothers. Do what's best for you. You're the only person that could tell you and know what's right for you. I could go out and run 15 miles in the morning. That works for me. If you can't do it, then you could only do two. That's best for you. Same thing with masonry. If you feel that you can do it a certain way, you do it however what fits for you. Don't let anybody else come up and tell you they did it this way or it works best this way. You do what's best for yourself. And only you and the great architect can tell you that. I love it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a great message for the brothers to hear. It's a personal journey in this fraternity, just like life. It is. And it is. we're here to be better people. And so do what's best for you to, to become a better person. Correct. I love it. All right. Thank you, brother. Well, thank you. We'll see you next thank you, time brother. from On the Level All Podcast. Right. We're out. All right. Thank you. Have a good one.